Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Wes, and it is a privilege to come to you this evening and share, uh, hopefully, a kind of a quick devotional this afternoon. Um, I'm kind of nursing a little sinus infection here. I've been cleaning out the shop and cleaning out the chicken coop, and all the dust has kind of gotten to me here, unfortunately. But I think that we can make it through without too much trouble. Uh, so I've got the privilege in the morning to preach at a local church, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and so I decided that it would be a good idea just to share with you kind of a condensed version of the sermon in the morning, because this is, this is an account in the Bible that has given me great encouragement. Uh, it could certainly lead to conviction as well. Uh, that's, that's what the Bible does, right? It convicts and then encourages. That's the whole point. But this is the story of Matthew, uh, the tax collector, and Jesus. And it comes out of Matthew chapter 9. We see it in uh, three of the Gospels, but tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9 and going through verse 13. It says this, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So this guy named Matthew he was a tax collector, right? And uh, tax collectors in Jesus' day in ancient Israel were really, really despised people. Um, they, here's, how they, here's how it operated. They would purchase franchises from the Roman government, and that franchise would allow them to levy taxes, and they would levy taxes on anything they possibly could. Just like somebody today might buy a Burger King franchise, which gives them the right, the right to sell Whoppers and French fries, these people would buy tax franchises so that they could levy taxes. And there was lots and lots of room for corruption and intimidation because whatever they collected above and beyond Rome's quota, they could keep it for themselves. So you can see lots and lots of room for corruption there. And Matthew was in a particularly awful state because he uh, was a Jewish man levying Roman taxes on his fellow Jews. And to say that he was hated and despised would really have been an understatement. So the religious establishment at the time, which was meant to bring grace and hope and mercy to the hopeless, people such as Matthew, uh, they condemned him basically as a traitor, as a robber. He couldn't give testimony in court. He was not allowed in the synagogue. Uh, he was actually ranked among the unclean animals. So if a tax collector touched you back in these days, you were ceremonially unclean. So you were quite literally ranked uh, in the same category as a pig. So Matthew knew about his sins. We can kind of tell that he was under conviction of his sins because of the way he reacts to Jesus. Jesus comes by and says, follow me, and Matthew just pops right up, right? So undoubtedly, Matthew had heard about Jesus, and he was under conviction, he was a hopeless and sinful individual, and he knew it. And what was worse is that he had been told that he was pretty well hopeless by the religious establishment, and he had been condemned by his own people. And the grace and the mercy that we see in Jesus' act of walking by this tax booth and looking into Matthew's hopeless eyes and saying, follow me, is just astounding. The most holy man who has ever walked the face of the earth comes by to one of the biggest <laughs> lowlifes in ancient Israelite society and bids him to follow him. Can I tell you today that we're actually all in the tax booth? We're actually all in this tax booth together. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. We're all lost and if you've been following Christ for a long time and, and you're saved, um, you've repented, you've called on Jesus to, to, to save you from your sins, that's a glorious thing, right? But we still have sin, right? We still have issues. We still have struggles and so on and so forth. But I want 
to show you something here that happens in this text. So Matthew is really happy, and he throws this party at his house, and he invites some of the seediest people that he can think of, most likely, which were probably his cronies from the tax collecting business. A lot of times tax collectors would employ uh, thieves and robbers and murderers and people such as that so that they could get money out of people. That's just kind of how the business worked back then. So Matthew threw a celebration, probably had quite a few of those type people here. And the remarkable part about it is Jesus is there. Jesus is there sitting in the midst of all these people. Again, the holiest man that had ever walked the face of the earth, sitting in the midst of people who had basically been condemned by their own people. We see here that Jesus calls the hopeless to himself. And we see that Jesus knows sinners. Now, I want you to know that that's a double-edged sword because Jesus knows sinners. He knows our struggles. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our hang-ups. He knows all of those things. But he also knows sinners, right? He knows of our sinfulness. He knows of, uh, he knows of our thoughts. He knows everything in between. Listen to 1 Chronicles 28.9, the last part of this verse. We'll do the whole thing. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. Now, I can't say that all of my thoughts today have been pure, and I'd be willing to venture that you can't either. But the Lord knows our thoughts, and that can be a terrifying thing, right? But what is Jesus doing here at the table? He's eating with these people. He's offering them hope in their hopelessness. It's amazing. Jesus, who the Pharisees thought should be condemning these people and walking away from them, is eating with these people. So we see here that Jesus saves sinners. It's his joy. It's his mission to save sinners. And we see again that Jesus knows sinners. Listen to Listen to Psalm 4017. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. Do you think the guys around the table with Jesus were poor and needy? I think so. Am I poor and needy? Absolutely. And yet the Lord takes thought for me. Psalm 103, 14. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Can you imagine a God who creates people in his own image to be holy as he is holy, and then those people rebel against him. And what does he do? He provides a way out. He provides a way such that the wrath of God can be absorbed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I want to end here I don't want to leave you with no understanding of how to appropriate this grace. So I want to end with Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I did not have it bookmarked. Give me just a second here. So Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells this parable of a tax collector and a sinner who come up to the temple to pray. 18.10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, it's easy to pick on these Pharisees because they're almost comical in their level of self-righteousness, but our, our self-righteousness shows up in other ways. It can show up in phrases and thoughts such as, man, I can't believe that they did that. Or I would, I would never, I would never do something like that. We all have these thoughts, right? We're all a Pharisee to one degree or another. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted.
it's a it's a tragedy so many of us go through life with uh, kind of thinking that we can do it all ourselves right like the pharisees can i tell you that we can't and can i tell you that the only attitude that is going to uh, get us anywhere in appropriating god's grace through faith in jesus is the attitude of this tax collector lord be merciful to me a sinner lord i don't have anything to offer you nothing in my hands i bring simply to the cross i cling i'm poor and i'm needy and praise god he knows that we are dust so i hope that this has encouraged you this evening uh, the lord knows who we are he knows our frame and he's provided jesus christ in his great mercy to save sinners like us. If we'll only humble ourselves before him, come to the cross, admit our sins, and say, Lord, have mercy to me, the sinner. Let's go to the mosquito in here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Lord, I want to come to you this evening and thank you for thank you for your words. Thank you for Matthew. Thank you for uh, your conviction that led Matthew to come out of that tax booth. And God we're all in a tax booth to one degree or another. We're all poor and we're needy. But God, we're so encouraged that Jesus eats with people like us. And it's his joy to eat with people like us. When the world says we're hopeless, when other people say that we're hopeless, and even when we ourselves say that we're hopeless, Jesus is there, hope in the midst of hopelessness. God, let us truly experience poverty of spirit such that we can come to the cross and say have mercy on me the sinner i've got nothing to offer and god i, under, I understand that there are a lot of hurting people out there this evening <coughs> excuse me there's a lot of hurting people out there this evening there are financial issues there are health issues there are relational issues uh, there are job issues and god at the same time there are reasons to rejoice perhaps there are uh, new children being born or new houses being moved to or uh, new jobs uh, going to or health issues that are that are over and god praise your name for that well we ask for help we ask for your grace in these areas where we hurt uh, emotional issues financial god the list goes on and everybody out there this evening i'm confident knows uh, just exactly what they are going through and i pray that we would all turn to you god in our poverty and um and ask for your help and praise you for what you've done through jesus keep us safe as we go through this week and god i just pray that we would glorify you in everything that we do in christ's name amen well thank y'all it was good and i will see y'all on the next one